Endless paperwork, endless trial and error by a dedicated laboratory staff result in 1944 in the discovery of the antibiotic streptomycin. But discovery is just the beginning. For two more years, the Waxman team works on methods of cultivating the microbe so as to produce greater yield, purity, and standardization. Meanwhile, clinical tests of streptomycin indicate amazing effectiveness against a wide range of disease-producing bacteria. And several of the large pharmaceutical companies are licensed to produce the drug. Eventually, streptomycin goes into mass production. The microbe is incubated in vats with capacities of many thousands of gallons. How much human suffering allayed because of streptomycin and the other antibiotics, which among them have drastically altered the world's public health picture in a single decade. For every ounce of streptomycin the pharmaceutical industry has produced, it has made royalty payments to Rutgers University, where every dollar has been put to very good use indeed. For example, here Dr. Waxman discusses with an architect the plans for a new $3 million Institute of Microbiology. The dream becomes a reality. The institute is completed, and inside it is installed the most up-to-date microbiological research equipment yet devised. In a glistening two-story pilot plant, manufacturing facilities of the big drug houses are duplicated on a smaller scale, not for the purpose of commercial production, but to extend research into still other very important areas. Another expensive tool made available at the Institute of Microbiology is the electron microscope, which enlarges an image up to 20,000 times. Photographic blow-ups permit further magnifications up to 100,000 times, giving close-up portraits of the infinitesimal public enemies still at large. Which of them will be the next to fall before well-organized fundamental research? Today, America's leaders of 1976 are studying in our high schools and colleges, learning what America has been, what it is now, and what it can become. The responsibility that falls on every teacher's shoulder is enormous. Industry believes each citizen should do what he can to lighten that load, to support and encourage the teacher in America, to be an active and sympathetic friend of education. Industry itself realizes its own obligations. More visibly and effectively each year, industry is becoming both the willing and welcome ally of education. A housewife returns a batch of empty bottles to her local supermarket. What must be done to these bottles before they can be used again? Providing the answers to that question is the full-time occupation of the men and women of Miller Hydro Company of Bainbridge, Georgia, manufacturers of all sorts of equipment for the bottling industry. Bottles, of course, come in every imaginable shape and size, so equipment for handling them is designed and built to accommodate whatever types the bottlers may be using. Here being assembled is the company's chief product, a bottle washer, which will render bottles sparkling clean and clean sterile at the rate of several thousand per hour. The washer is entirely automatic. Since it will be expected to operate day and night almost without let up for years on end, these people make sure the bugs are eliminated before a unit leaves the factory. They set it up and put it through its paces. Bottles are conveyed to an unscrambler into the washer. Now begins a cycle of six rinsings, washings, and soakings, any one of which is more thorough than a cleaning job done by hand. The machine typifies the care with which our food and beverage industries protect the public health, going far beyond the requirements of law to ensure that their products reach the consumer in a state of absolute purity. At a plant in Charlotte, North Carolina, worn crankshafts by the thousands, all sorts of it arrive for reconditioning. Every part of the world, 
call for restoration of the crankshafts to original factory condition or better. But how can such a complex machine part be restored to its precise original contours? Well, a patented process begins here at American Crankshaft Company with a thorough cleaning to remove rust and grease and to permit close examination. A penetrating dye sprayed on the surface would show up otherwise invisible cracks or other flaws that might render a crankshaft unsatisfactory for reclamation. When shown to be basically sound, the crankshaft, after a preparatory heat treatment, is rebuilt in a number of stages by an electric welding arc submerged in flux, hard surfaced with a wear and corrosion resistant steel. Next, the built-up surfaces are rough ground to approximately their final proportions. Between every two operations, there's an inspection and a heat treatment to eliminate stresses within the metal. In finished grinding, specifications call for a tolerance of just one thousandth of an inch. We said that the reconditioned shafts are often better than they were originally. The explanation for that is that comparatively few crankshafts are surface hardened, as these are in the course of being reclaimed. One of the final steps is balancing, as painstaking a process as all the others. Minute portions of metal are drilled away until the weight of the odd-shaped instrument is equally distributed all around its axis. We Americans are reputed in some foreign lands to be a wasteful lot, but we're not as prodigal with our raw materials and manufactured goods as many people regard us. We spend a lot for machines of all kinds, but from those machines we demand and get an awful lot of mileage. Over the years, industry has made great progress in establishing a plant environment which recognizes the importance and dignity of the employee as an individual. The highest level of steady work and pay, far better health and safety protection, benefit programs to safeguard him and his family, opportunities for education and training. These are just a few of the human relations advances which have given the employee a greater sense of satisfaction and security on the job. American women, are they the best dressed in the world because they can afford the most expensive shops and dressmakers? No, most U.S. women cannot afford such things. And yet look at these women. The smart creations they're wearing were all made at home. Part of the reason for the widespread interest in and skill at sewing can be traced to thousands of sewing classes like this one in Charlottesville, Virginia, where women learn not only the routine chores of mending, patching, and altering, and fashion and be Knowles each year take the 20-hour course offered by the Singer Sewing Machine Company alone. Fees paid by students offset only part of the costs of the Nuffet School maintained by the firm. At the Singer Educational Department in New York City, supervisors are trained in methods of instructing new teachers. These women will help direct the 2,000 member staff of what may be the largest private educational system in the world, all devoted to just one general subject. Sewing instructors must be familiar with just about all the patterns made available to home sew high fashion gowns from crazy quilts to slip covers. But the basic sewing course these women will show others how to teach deals primarily with dressmaking. Improved patterns and aids like this have made even complicated sewing jobs quite simple. Another big help has been the invention of sewing machine attachments for special effects like zigzag and blind stitching.
In another sewing center, one of the supervisors passes on her learning to a group of women who will lead training classes for 4-H club teenagers, still another facet of this extensive program. She points out that taking proper care of one's tools is the mark of the expert in any field of endeavor. thousand volunteers currently are leading 4-H sewing sessions like this one in which future homemakers get a terrific kick out of realizing how much they can accomplish with their own hands. Even the very small fry have their own so handy course. Working with toy sewing machines they take very seriously the matter of creating wardrobes for their dolls. From tiny tots to grandmothers, American women appear to have rediscovered the sewing machine. Skill that can take to the air. What primitive instruments are these children using? 